DiscerningHearts.com presents That All May Be One, a Holy Week Retreat with Monsignor John Essif and Sister Cora Immaculata Heffernan. Monsignor Essif is a Roman Catholic priest in the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania. He's lived in areas around the world serving the Pontifical Missions, a Catholic organization established by St. Pope John Paul II to bring the good news to the world, especially to the poor. He is a founding member of the Pope Leo XIII Institute, which trains priests in the areas of exorcism, deliverance, and healing. He has served as a retreat director and confessor to St. Teresa of Calcutta. He continues to offer direction and retreats for the Sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. Often he leads those retreats with Sister Cora Immaculatum Heffernan, who is a member of the Sisters Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She holds several degrees from Marywood, Notre Dame, and Syracuse universities. She's an accomplished musician and artist, as well as a counselor and spiritual director. We now offer this special presentation, That All May Be One, a Holy Week Retreat, with Monsignor John Nesif and Sister Cora Maculatum Heffernan. But I really believe that yesterday, when we did good when we did Palm Sunday, uh, it really isn't. It, that's, that's like a charade for us and for those people that will be watching. What we really are inviting you to is the Messiahship and the kingship of Jesus Christ. And the kingship of Jesus Christ was shown not on the that, and that messianic charade that took place on Palm Sunday, because the people who participated was also faky. Uh, the, one of the people that took place in it was was Judas, who by Wednesday was betraying the king, and and then all of those apostles were abandoning him and, and would abandon him by and so his kingship did not really take place and three times three times before he kept saying to them before this this uh, so-called messianic triumph took place in Jerusalem I don't want this to be my hour my hour has not has come right from the beginning of his uh, of his miracles. He said to his mother at Cana, in the first miracle he ever performed, "My hour has not yet come." What did he mean by that hour? My hour is that when I will be crowned the king. And when is that? When they will kill me. I'm telling you, my kingship is going to be a suffering, a death, and a resurrection. My triumph is going to be that I will triumph over sin and Satan and even death itself. And so the resurrection is the triumph over death. Jesus on Calvary triumphs over sin and Satan, and now his kingdom will come. But until my hour, what are we going to do? And when you asked us to do this, I really feel it's an invitation to anyone who wants to make this retreat. Not to turn on your your uh, television or turn on your whatever uh, communication that you're using to, to do discerning hearts, but really and truly to go into your own heart. Because really, your heart is Christ's heart. Do you want to make this retreat? Then on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, 
of this week, we are inviting you to go into your heart. This invitation was for us to go into our hearts so that sister and I can share the inner life that we believe that Christ wants to reveal through us and through this podcast and through this communication that you are going to receive Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Now, on, on Monday of Holy Week, the events that are going to take place are that Jesus and, and his apostles are going to withdraw into Bethany. Now, what does it look like they're doing? They're actually pulling back. They're, they're, Jesus actually is, is not rushing into his death. He has seen what had happened on, on Palm Sunday, and he realizes his time has come, and he is preparing his heart for what is about to take place and what is going on in his heart. We get a little inkling of that as Sister reads to us on the account of what happened that day on Monday of Holy Week. Sister John 12. Six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. They gave a dinner for him, and Martha served while Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary took a liter of costly perfumed oil made from genuine aromatic nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and dried them with her hair. The house was filled with fragrance of the oil. Then Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, and the one who would betray him said, Why was this oil not sold for 300 days' wages and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and held the money bag and used to steal the contributions. So Jesus said, Leave her alone. Let her keep this for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The large crowd of the Jews found out that he was there and came, not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And the chief priests plotted to kill Lazarus too, because many of the Jews were turning away and believing in Jesus because of him. As Jesus went into his heart on this occasion, he realized in his heart that this anointing was the beginning of the anointing of the Messiah. And this woman anointed his feet. She was going to be the one that accompanied his mother up to the hill of Calvary. She was also going to be the one to see him on that day of my enthronement as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I, as I go into my heart, know that this man who just spoke up is a thief. And he is actually going to, this week, not tomorrow, but the day after, is going to plan to kill me. You see, we all we already know these facts. Can you come in to the heart of Jesus as he's going through this reflection? Reflect with us these days, but let this be in your own heart as you go deeper and deeper into your heart on this occasion. And come with our Lord as he goes deeper and deeper into his own heart. And Sister is going to read to you exactly what's been happening 
as Jesus reflects on what is going to be his messianic call, his kingship. This is the coming of Jesus' hour. There were some Greeks among those who had come to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida and Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But it was for this purpose that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. There are three times when God the Father spoke and now he breaks in again from heaven. And this is a very, very important time in his son's establishment of the kingdom that he has sent him to do. At the baptism of John, God spoke from heaven and he spoke and he said in the, in, in the gospel of Matthew, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And as the father spoke, the Holy Spirit came down upon Jesus to anoint him. He also spoke at the transfiguration when he was up on the hill and he said of the mountain there in transfigured form when he was talking to Moses and Elijah and a voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And the voice that came from heaven this time, I have glorified him and I will glorify him again. And I will glorify him on that mountain. Go with him and be glorified with him. So God is giving testimony again of this beloved son of his. He has sent him into the world to bring harmony, unity, and peace to the entire world. The instrument that he's going to use is not that Palm Sunday procession that falls apart, but the instrument that he's going to use is Calvary, there where his son suffers and dies. When Jesus died on the cross, all of the world went silent. The angels went silent. And the whole entire world was up in, in upheaval. God died. So much so, he sent his son into the world and he died so that we could live. He conquered death on the cross at Easter. And so the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Christ is what we take 
in, in every time we come to Mass. What we do at Mass is no different than what he did in the year 33. And so how important is it that each of us during this time, during this Holy Week, takes the time to go back inside our own hearts and begins to reflect again on how we need him to redeem us from our darkness and from our sinfulness, from our brokenness, and from our death. At that same time, uh, when uh, the Father was glorifying Jesus, he was predicting exactly what Father John just said now. The crowd there thought it was thunder, but others said an angel has spoken to him. But listen to Jesus, what, what Jesus then said. This voice did not come for my sake, but for yours. Now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. He said that indicating the kind of death he would die. So the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that the Messiah remains forever. Then how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Jesus said to them, The light will be among you only a little while. Walk while we have the light, so that darkness may not overcome you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know what he is doing. While you have light, believe in the light. So, you, so that you may become children of the light. Beloved brothers and sisters, this is exactly what we're inviting you into these next three days. This Monday of Holy Week, this Tuesday of Holy Week, this Wednesday, we're inviting each of you to go into your heart. And there, begin to examine whether you are walking in the light. And only the light can reveal to you your brokenness. Nothing else. So many of us, for instance, when I offered Mass this very morning, what did I do? I approached the altar with this beginning prayer. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, who were they? They were all of the saints looking at me from heaven. They were all of the angels adoringly looking and all of those in purgatory and any of those over all those years that I have ever said that prayer, I confess to Almighty God that I have sinned. Is that an empty phrase? And I'm asking you to explain, to reflect on your own brokenness in my thoughts, in my words, in what I have done. And what I have failed to do. Now, Sister is going to give us a help of how to bring that light to bear in our hearts. You see, you can't reflect with your own eye on your brokenness. It will never reveal to you. Your human conscience will never tell you what you did that's wrong in your words, what you did that's wrong in your actions, what you did that's wrong in your behavior, and, and what, what you did and didn't do in your omissions. Only the Holy Spirit, it's the light that comes into the world. 
Sister, could you read John 3, 16 to 21? I think for the examine that we have to have here, who is the one who reveals this to us? John 3, 20, uh, 16 to 21. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not son, send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the verdict, that the light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light because their works were evil. For everyone who does evil and wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light so that his works might not be exposed. But whoever lives the truth comes to the light so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God. And so the beautiful thing right here now is to uh, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to me and to you what it is that is somehow keeping you from being totally united with God. And with Jesus, what is it that prevents you from being united with his love? Um, and so often we, we hear people say, and sometimes we've even said it ourselves, well, I don't have any real sins. I, you know, I haven't committed murder. I haven't stolen. I haven't done anything that is mortal sin of nature. Um, and I only have a few venial sins, but that's, that's really not what we're going to ask the Holy Spirit for um, right now, for uh, guidance and light. Uh, let us ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us those attitudes that we have, those tendencies that we have that are keeping us from being a totally united with the will of God. And those attitudes and habits uh, and tendencies that we have are things like um, jealousy, envy. Do you find yourself gossiping about somebody? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you, why are you gossip gossiping about that person? What is it within you? Are you envious of that person? Uh, are you... Uh, jealous uh, that, uh, that they might take something away from you by being supposedly better than you are? Um, are you unforgiving? Have you found yourself saying, uh, oh, uh, uh, yes, I forgive, but I will never forget. That's not, that's not true forgiveness. Uh, uh, are there times that you are very proud of things you've done? Uh, because you feel, well, I worked hard. I did that. Uh, maybe, you know, if you really look at it, the Holy Spirit reveals it to you, you'll realize that you couldn't even have done anything at all if God had not given you the grace and the power to do it. It's his power working within us. And so there are tendencies. Some of our tendencies might be to uh, pornography, uh, to uh, thoughts that are, are uh, th thoughts of lust. Uh, uh, so we have to look at our thoughts and our, uh, our uh, feelings. Now, thoughts and feelings themselves are not sins, but they can be attitudes that drive us and, and uh, really make us so weak that we can fall into uh, that sin. But it's the attitude of sinfulness. You know, the, the development of a real 
Christian and a true Christian conscience is that uh, we can, uh, with the light of the Holy Spirit, we can accept the fact that we are sinful people and that our, our sinfulness and, and say, yes, I am a sinner. As we are able to say that on one end of our the spectrum of our conscience, on the other end, at the same time, grows our belief and our trust that God is a forgiving God. So no matter what we have done, God has uh, saved us through the power of Jesus dying, suffering and dying on the cross to save us from our sins. And so what happens it, when you ask for the revelation of the or the light of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us our sinfulness, what happens is it's like an aha moment. Aha, that's what I've been doing. And that's why I've been doing it. And, and there comes such a freedom just, just to acknowledge we don't have to be perfect. If we just read through scriptures and we, we see how so often God is drawn to the weakest, the most sinful, the, the most abandoned, the one who seems to be lost is the one who draws the heart of God and who drew the heart of Jesus in all his actions. And so there is a joy in that once we're able to acknowledge, yes, I am a sinner. I am a redeemed sinner. When we look at the list of saints, they are the first to tell us that we are the sinners. For instance, Peter. Peter was the one who denied him over and over and over again. Before the cop, that wounded the heart of Jesus when he knew and he saw that Peter was trying to do this on his own. And he came in, he was warming himself around the fire. And the silly little girl was the first one and the first time he fell. And then just a few minutes later, he falls again and again. You see, Peter falls because he thought he had the strength within himself. I will go and I will die with you. So did Thomas and all the rest say it. But as soon as the problem came, they all vanished with the exception of John. And I think he was only there because he was an unshaven youth. And Mary, I believe, is the one who helped him, the mother of Jesus. And she had the strength because she was conceived without sin, the only one. There is no other who has sinlessness except Mary. All the rest of us are sinners. And so as we come to this day of reflection, this Monday, this Tuesday, and this Wednesday, let's be invited by Magdalene and the anointing that she gave to Jesus and the reflection of his sacred heart on what she had done. And let's be invited again to go more deeply into the heart of Jesus when he tells us, I am really troubled. My, my heart is troubled. To remain in the light is his invitation. And then his father comes to strengthen us in that time. And all of us need to hear the voice of God saying, I have glorified him and I will glorify him again. And what is it that's going to take us more deeply into tomorrow, Thursday and Friday and Saturday? What is that that's going to take us to his suffering 
and to his death. It's going to be that we will truly allow him to stir up in us those graces that came with our baptism, with our confirmation, with our Eucharist that exploded inside of us. You see, my brothers and sisters, you are Christ already. But how many times we have failed to recognize that the power that is within us is him. It's not ourselves. And so one of the major, major sins, as Sister brought up, is not just jealousy or envy or judgment or unfor even unforgiveness, but that I am so confident and trusting in myself that I will feel so self-confident that I cannot fail. I will not fail. And do you notice the big emphasis is on the I. And as soon as I begin to become the center of my own strength, the evil one is sooner or later going to get me. Because each of us has, and he's going around even now as we're talking, he's going around your outer walls and he knows and the evil one has a, a, a bead on everyone's weakness. If there are seven billion human beings in this world right now, he knows those who have the tendency that Judas had toward money and power. That was what the downfall of Judas was. Overconfidence is what Peter led, was led into his denial. I love, I, 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 and, and he failed. And how many of us over and over again have such confidence in ourselves and that's what brings us to the fall. The self-reliance, there's nothing I can't do. So many times in my life, in fact, I was brought up in, in, a, in a culture that had told me, strive to be the first, strive to be the best, Cooperation is really what the spirit of the gospel is. Each one has gifts, and each one can look to the gifts of the other. You see, if you're husband and wife, your wife has gifts you don't have. And maybe, for instance, suppose you're in a married relationship and she really has a, a capacity to make more money in her teaching or in her work than you do as a man. How important it is that you, that you be a stay-at-home dad and all the kinds of harmony that can exist in that home when the two use the gifts that they mutually have. That the husband is not exactly as gifted as his wife. And for what, whatever that might be, cooperation brings harmony and peace. Contrast and Comparison brings conflict and, and striving to beat one another, to be the first and the best. And so 
self-reliance can be and how many of us examine ourselves on that particular area of our lives that I feel as if I don't have to call on God. And the more I am confident in myself, the less many times I call on him. The more I call on him, the more I am trusting that I am able to do whatever he asks me to. Whatever he wants me to do, I can do because he asks me to do it. I have the strength, the power, and the grace to do it. The light is, I am the light of the world. Walk in the light and you will not walk in darkness. The first letter of John says that so beautifully. Now this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we continue to walk in darkness, we lie and do not act in the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of his son Jesus cleanses us from all sin. If we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we acknowledge our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That is so beautiful that acknowledgement of who we are, his creatures, his weak, sinful creatures, whom he loves so much that he sent his son to die for us. Uh, what light there is and what joy there is in knowing that we can be forgiven and that we are loved uh, and it is all because of the tremendous gift of himself that Jesus did for us during during these next days let us uh, let us be grateful but let it come from our hearts and from where we really know the truth about our ourselves and our actions and our motives and let's turn it all over to him i've invited you during these days to go into your heart to go deep within your heart and he is there waiting for you. Without me, he says, you can do nothing. Remain in me, and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. Ask for whatever you will, so that as you go deeper and deeper into yourself, he is there waiting for you. And especially during these days, to cleanse you, to heal you, to strengthen you, and to bless you. Sister has uh, an, a, a, a little uh, a, a scripture that she first wants to have you do. To, you know, what can we do over these three days? We can pray, and especially the words of scripture. They, they will be so powerful to bring you into these reflections where you reflect not just on it's it's the word of God that will because he's there and he's speaking to you deep and, uh, and powerfully through these words. What we suggest that you do during these days is especially these three days um, is uh, Look at the outline that will be on uh, discerning hearts. And there you will see the scriptures to which we've referred during this conference. 
Uh, they all have to do with unbelief, darkness, betrayal, and abandonment that Jesus felt and knew as he was coming to his hour. And so if you would, first of all, slowly and uh, take some of these scriptural quotes that you will see uh, outlined for you and ponder the words of the Gospels and, uh, and just place yourselves with Jesus uh, at that particular time. And then the second uh, thing I ask is that, or we ask is that, um, when are the times that you have found yourself troubled? And how have you, uh, how have you sought the help of God when you have felt betrayed and when you have been troubled? Uh, and uh, look into yourself. Uh, what is your darkness? Uh, there was darkness at that at, in those hours, uh, but what is your darkness? What is your sinfulness, your attitude, or your tendency toward sin? Um, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you your sinfulness and your hour of darkness when you have turned away from the light. Some people have envy and jealousy. That, that's their big one. You know, ever since I was a little girl, when my sister got a new dress, I was jealous. And all through, all through school, when someone got A's, I was envious and jealous. And then when I got out of school, and all my life, if somebody got a better job, or if someone got a new house, or a new car, or whatever, that that has been part of me. That's the way I, I it's, it, it, jealousy is, is, is part of my brokenness. Or ever since I was a little child, a dirty thoughts, dirty pictures, masturbation, the tendency toward lust. This is my weakness. Ever since I was a child, if you hurt me, I was going to hurt you back retaliation, anger, unforgiveness. This was the way I was, the, 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 the tendency. You see, each of us has different dispositions, different tendencies. And if you could look back over your life and see what that particular tendency is, pride, self-centeredness, I, I just want to, have my name out there, uh, what was more important than anything, whatever that might be. And so it, I think that's one of the tendencies. Uh, when you do that and look back over your life, uh, remember that one light of, from, of the Holy Spirit will teach you more about yourself than a hundred years of introspection. Introspection can get you caught into being uh, being so important. You're thinking about yourself all the time, uh, and you'll never learn about yourself, uh, your real self, as truly and as peacefully as when the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. It's the light of the Holy Spirit that is going to give you the understanding, the acceptance of self, the knowledge that you can be forgiven and you are forgiven, and that you are loved by a redeeming Savior. Sister, can you have the final word? May these days be days of love and gratitude and Thanksgiving to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And may we always go with Mary along this road.
to our salvation. Amen. Amen. As we uh, are together uh, for the rest of this week, we will be uh, also uh, we, yesterday, and today, and 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 Thursday, and uh, Sunday, and uh, each day during the week, as we uh, personally uh, walk with Jesus through Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then Thursday. Friday, Saturday, and then Easter Sunday, we will be together again. And so let us pray for one another. Uh, and another thing that I, I think might be helpful to you is when you are doing the uh, looking into yourself or asking the Holy Spirit to reveal to you where your weakness is or um, where you have failed in one way or another, uh, always look to see if the looking down into that uh, gives you that moment that I called before an aha moment. But is there a peace within you? If there is a peace within you as you uh, look at that, that is the voice of the Holy Spirit. But if within you, you hear an accusing voice, see, you're no good at all. You've done this from the time you were a child. You're never going to be able to, to uh, overcome it. Um, you're terrible. Uh, whose voice is that? That is not the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's the voice of the accuser. And the evil spirit is always the accuser. Uh, the Holy Spirit is always the convincer. And with convincing, uh, being convinced that you are a sinner, uh, and knowing that you are a forgiven sinner because Jesus died on the cross for you, uh, and your sin is forgiven, there will be a peace that comes. Uh, ask yourself or look deeply into yourself, what are you feeling? If you're feeling anxious and, and uh, fearful and uh, confused, and uh, that is the voice of the, that's not the voice of God, that's the voice of an accuser. And he's trying to get you to accuse yourself uh, rather than to accept yourself. And so uh, try, try to uh, discern whose voice is that. I am finding out about myself because the Holy Spirit has shed light on it. And he's convincing me that God sent Jesus to save me, and therefore I am a forgiven sinner, no matter how sinful. No matter how grievous the sin has been, I am forgiven through Jesus dying on the cross for me and rising from the dead and, and ascending the Holy Spirit. Uh, there is a peace that comes for that. And you will be able to recognize within your own heart and your own being that, that feeling of acceptance of self and being accepted by God. If, on the other hand, you find yourself being accused and upset and angry and almost despairing and saying, I can never do it, that's the voice of the evil spirit. The evil spirit always lies. He's a liar uh, and uh, he's a, a divider uh, and he's a hater. And, and so any of those feelings that you feel, uh, immediately identify the voice. And what you should do when you hear that voice is turn it off. Don't even give a moment's thought to that. It's like closing a window. You're not going to hear it. You're not going to listen to it. Uh, and hear the words of Jesus 
Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And know that you are forgiven. And so during these days, uh, we are going to come back again on Thursday and then on Sunday. Um, during these days, just be at peace. Place yourself, you know, just under the mantle of Mary and walk with her during these days. Know that she has her mantle of protection around you. And she, in her fidelity and her love for you, uh, there is nothing that you have done that cannot be forgiven. And so uh, be at peace and have that grateful heart and have great hope uh, in your resurrection into new life also. The Holy Spirit convinces. The evil one accuses. That's so beautiful, sister. Yes. Amen. Thank you. You've been listening to That All May Be One, a Holy Week retreat with Monsignor John Essif and Sister Cora Immaculata Heffernan. To hear and or to download the podcast for this particular conference, visit discerninghearts.com. This particular conference can be viewed on discerninghearts.com as well as on the Discerning Hearts YouTube channel. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. We hope that if this has been helpful for you that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com. God bless.